love movie posters. More specifically, I love great movie posters. But what makes a movie poster great? Well, I would say creating an iconic, memorable image that best represents the tone of the film. Now there's a lot of different kinds of posters out there, especially these days, and they all have different purposes, from teaser posters, just hinting at a concept, to character posters to show off the cast. Often, a movie's poster is going to be your first exposure to a film, and ideally, it should make an impression on you. It should get you interested, excited. So today, let's pay tribute to some of the most iconic movie posters of all time by giving them the perler treatment and shrinking them down so they fit on these 5 by 7 inch canvases. Presenting batch one of our new series, Mini Movie Posters. First up, Jaws. This quintessential image was created by artist Roger Castell. In terms of sheer art design, for me, this is up there with American Gothic and the Mona Lisa. I'm serious. And it's probably been parodied just as much. I love the big red letters in all caps. The shark looks terrifying and absolutely massive compared to the swimmer. I appreciate that it just focuses on a particular moment to tell a visual story. The composition and colors lead your eyes upward. It has a momentum to it. You see, this Steven Spielberg kid was a new director, and most of the cast were fairly average, lesser-known stars. The poster had to sell the movie based solely on the story. It teases what's about to happen. It says, hey, you want to see this shark eat this lady? You buy a ticket. And it didn't disappoint, as it's the movie's opening scene. Brilliant. I gave the impression of the water getting darker by going with toothpaste, sky, turquoise, then teal. I went with straight lines, but if you want, you can try dithering to help blend the colors a bit. When it comes to judging something's artistic value based on aesthetic design, cultural impact, and influential iconography, it doesn't get any better than Jaws. Now, you're probably more familiar with this Star Wars poster that came out later, but we'll be paying tribute to the original here. It goes for a fantasy pulp art style, like something out of Conan the Barbarian. Hero raising his weapon, muscly chest rippling amongst the stars, girl at his feet, threat in the background. The original didn't even worry about having the characters look like the actors because the actors weren't famous. Boy, that sure changed. When the film became a mega hit, the poster was reissued to theaters with the faces of Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher. And I can't really criticize the original for not caring about the actors' likenesses. I mean, this is my version. So, yeah. This was also the point where I decided I wanted to have the title on each poster. Sure, it's easy to fit a short one like Jaws, but here's Star Wars. Obviously not readable, but I think the design is recognizable in the context of the image. In 1979, sci-fi existed, horror existed, but this film was one of the first big mashups of both genres. So how do you market such a thing? Play up the mystery, the fear of the unknown. This egg cracking, hatching, revealing an eerie green glow, giving birth to... something. But what? It's unlike anything we've ever seen. It's not of this earth. It's completely... alien. Fun fact, they made the poster before the actual egg designs were finalized, which is why it doesn't even look like the eggs in the movie. This design makes good use of nearly all the greens Perler has given us over the years. It's too white in the middle, expanding outward into cream, sherbet, prickly pear, sour apple, kiwi lime, bright green, shamrock, dark green, and evergreen. Wow. E.T.'s first poster was the famous finger touch, clearly based on Michelangelo's ceiling, the Sistine Chapel. But I've always preferred the iconic Bike Over the Moon poster. Such a magical moment in the movie, I can hear the music when I look at this poster. This image even went on to become the official logo of Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment. The moon is a white circle, but I'll be throwing in some robin's egg to give the surface some texture, and then just a handful of toothpaste scattered on the right here for some variation. Hardly noticeable really, but that's the point sometimes. Forget limiting it to just movie posters, the Ghostbusters logo is straight up one of the most recognizable pieces of iconography ever. I mean, right up there with Superman's crest or the McDonald's golden arches. The original teaser poster didn't even have the title, just the logo and a tagline. Pretty gutsy marketing considering Ghostbusters was a brand new property. Black, white, and red. This poster is a celebration of simplicity. And because the original idea for the logo was actually Dan Aykroyd's, I like to think that Ray came up with it. And again, we were able to fit the titles Alien and E.T. pretty easily. With Ghostbusters, you gotta cut me some slack. When I watched this movie as a kid, I didn't even know DeLoreans were real cars. I thought it was just a neat, retro, futuristic vehicle created for the movie. Seeing it lit up on this poster with the flaming tire tracks just captivated me. The title, Back to the Future, was kind of a funny pun. And I love the gradient effect on the curved logo. 
So shiny, so chrome. Bold choices all around. I think this poster actually uses the most colors with all the shades in the background. And I think I did alright with this title. You can pretty clearly see the back there, and kind of future if you squint a little. I know, another Spielberg. Last one, I promise. Similar to Ghostbusters, Jurassic Park lets the logo do the talking. This makes sense. The dinosaur reveal is such a pivotal moment in the movie, you don't want to give it away on the poster. Great example of less is more. Juck Pock will have to do. I loved this movie as a kid, and I think it still looks great. That little curly cliff looking over the pumpkin patch with the moon backdrop is such moody imagery and really highlights the loneliness that Jack feels. Kind of sad, but whimsical. Now I'm keeping these designs minimal, so we can't get into too much detail, but by using just a few colors to represent each glowing pumpkin, I think we can establish the setting well. They're just little spots of orange, yellow, and rust. Forget about that text though. I tried my best, but this one's gonna have to be purely representative. So as I said in the beginning, we're going to be mounting each of these on some 5x7 inch canvases. They can be glued right on and are ready for hanging. But another option presents itself. If we're going to have these pieces mounted on a surface anyway, why not use our traditional painted canvas for the solid color backgrounds? Now some of you may be saying, Kyle, having the canvas be the background elevates the presentation of the perler beads and gives the pieces a cool 3D element. And others may say, Kyle, you're only doing this because you're lazy and you don't want to fill in a bunch of black beads every time you make this. Well, you're both right. But if the quicker method leads to better presentation, that's win-win. As always, the choice is yours. It's nifty to make the full background in beads though, because I'm also working on creating custom pieces for people. They choose two or four of their favorite posters, and I mount them all together on these nice canvas painted to be the colors of cinema curtains. Pretty cool. Now obviously we've got a lot more movie posters to go, and I do admit this first batch was a little predictable. I think most of these are objectively considered some of the most famous and well-known posters in movie history. But hey, we had to get the all-time greats out of the way, right? So tell me, my friends, what movie posters would you like to include in the next batch? Let me know down below. Thanks for joining me today. I'll see you next time.